So my topic today is steadfastness in changing times. Steadfastness in changing times. Before I came to choose this topic, God spoke to my spirit that we are in changing times, especially since we are in the end times. But God spoke to my spirit that his children are not as faithful as they should be, even in normal times, which means that as the times are changing and becoming evil, they would have to work harder and be more resolute in order to be able to stay steadfast in the changing times. So I'll take my text from 1 Corinthians 15, 57 and 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and 58. It says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. For as much as ye know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So in other words, my topic would mean that we should be decisively and devotedly firm and unwavering in our walk with the Lord. We have to be firmly devoted to the Word of God and the things pertaining to God during changing times. In order for us to live steadfast during changing times, we have to know how to live steadfast during normal times. We must never forget that there is only one steadfast and unmovable reference point in life, and that's the Word of God. Only one, and that's the Word of God. We must therefore strive to be steadfast and unmovable in our commitment to obeying the Word of God. You see, when we get saved, we become God's representatives or his ambassadors on this earth and therefore building God's kingdom has to be the highest priority of every Christian every child of God for us to be steadfast in normal times we have to first aspire to live a holy and a righteous life daily you see, the key word here is daily. If we strive to live a holy and a righteous life, whenever we please, whenever we think we should, we will be defeated Christians because the devil's goal is to make sure that he gets God's children to be wayward and disobedient to the word of God. You see, we are told in uh, first, first Peter 1, 13 to 16. It says, Wherefore, guard up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. This is God speaking. God, who is our Heavenly Father, is holy, and He's calling His children to be holy. We cannot have a holy God as a Father, and we be unholy. See, the only way that we'll be able to accomplish that type of holiness is for us to develop godly passions. 
passion. When someone has passion for something, they go all out of their way to do it. We have to develop godly passions. You see, when we develop these passions, they will not only make us sensitive to sin, but they would make us, they will keep us from the presence of sin. They will keep us from the penalties of sin. And these passions will keep us from the power of sin. It is the desire of our Heavenly Father to connect His giftings for us with our passion. But we have to be willing. We have to be willing to do the will of God. The thing is, even though God has all power, He's almighty, He's all powerful, God does not supersede our will. We have to be willing. God has the power to force us. But if we notice, God doesn't force anybody. He doesn't supersede our will. And because God doesn't supersede our will, the devil does not have that power. Because God created the devil. If God has all the power, that means the devil's power is nothing compared to God's power. So if God cannot force us, that means the devil doesn't have that power to force us either. So when once we say no to the devil, then the devil will not be able to force us. So when people say, oh, the devil made me do it, the devil did not make you do it. You did it because you wanted to. That was your intention, that was your will. You see, during this life's race, it is our will that counts. So we have to be willing in serving God. Apart from being willing, we also have to be faithful to the things of God. Many people have so many excuses why they cannot be faithful in serving God. So many excuses. What is our excuse? That's the question I want to ask. What is our excuse? We have to think soberly and think, what is our excuse? We have to really focus on what our excuse is in making us less motivated about the things of God. Because if you know what is preventing you from doing the will of God, you'll be able to correct it so that you'll be able to live right before God. God loves us very, very much. And so he does whatever it takes to protect his children from evil and from the dangerous plots of the devil. You know, from time to time, God allows us to go through varying levels of adversities. But those are adversities that he knows that we can withstand. If you notice, I said varying levels of adversities. God cannot give me an adversity that I cannot withstand. He cannot give you an adversity that you cannot withstand. When a baby is crawling, you cannot go and stand halfway down the stairs and tell the baby, come on, come on, and expect the baby to crawl downstairs because you know the baby will fall down. But if that child is walking, you can stand halfway downstairs and say, come on, and that child will walk and come. So the level of adversity that God puts us through is based on our spiritual strength and our spiritual level. And the reason, you would ask, well, why would God want to give me adversity when God loves me so much? You see, God gives us adversities intentionally to help us build strong spiritual muscles and also for us to de de develop deep spiritual roots so that we'll be able to get firmly anchored during times of spiritual storm. However, despite God's attempts to keep us spiritually anchored, we have seen and heard about many Christians who crumble under those adversities. They crumble under adversities. That is because not only are their roots shallow, their spiritual roots are shallow, but they also get very distracted 
by the constant whispers from the devil. You see, as a result, when they listen to the devil constantly, instead of listening to God, what happens? They start to waver. They become easy prey for the devil. They become double-minded. And before you know it, they start to unravel. And they start to backstep. They turn around and start walking away from God. We have heard of Christians or maybe met some who claim to have loved God so much. And it comes to a time when they turn and walk away and say, ah, I don't believe in God anymore. I don't trust God anymore. If God was there, he would not allow me to go through this. If God loved me that much, he wouldn't allow me to go through this. Yes, that's because they become double-minded. But what they fail to remember is that there are only two parts in life. Just like a coin has two sides. Just like a dollar bill has two sides. Life has two parts. When they turn and they walk away from God, what they fail to remember is the turning and walking onto the path into the devil's den. That's the path they're walking into, right into the devil's path, into the devil's trap. We have to remain steadfast and unmovable in our faith in God. Let us try to remember that no matter what comes our way, God is totally in control. Let us remember that no matter how hopeless the situation or the circumstances may be, God is still in control. No matter how much the devil throws at us, we can always count on the light of God's saving power as our beacon of hope. We can count on the light of God's saving power as our beacon of hope. Psalm 119 verse 105 tells us that God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. If we stick by the word of God, that will serve as a light on the path for us on this journey to earth. In Hebrews 3, 12 to 14, we are told, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. This passage tells us about partakers and who they are. We are being prepared now as partakers in the glorious kingdom to come. You see, as partakers, we have to live our lives as faithful to Christ as possible because partakers are people who endure to the end. The Bible tells us that if we endure to the end, we will be saved. To the end, when we get saved, it's good. But walking away, that does not leave us anywhere good because we have to stand before God one day. Verse 13 of that uh, passage, Hebrews 3.13, <coughs> tells us to exhort one another, that is to encourage one another. <coughs> if we want to be partakers, we have to hang out with Christians. We, ha we have to hang out with Christians who would encourage us and not those who would discourage us. <coughs> Excuse me, let me get my water. It's here. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> 
we have to we have to we have to hang out with Christians who would encourage us, not those who would discourage us, because not every Christian is a partaker, and not every Christian is going to be a partaker. So we should hang out with people who will tell us, just keep it up and be encouraged. Let us remember that when Christ returns, he is not only going to be to come to be our bridegroom, but he's also going to be our judge. Jesus is going to judge our works after we get saved, not before we get saved. Because Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tell us, For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. When we get saved, you can boast because it's the gift of God. Mm -hmm. In Philippians 3, 13 to 14, the apostle Paul tells us, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the price of the high calling of God in Christ. He said, I press towards the goal. This walk that we own is a walk where we have to press. Let us be dedicated and disciplined and let us press towards the mark. <coughs> For the price of the high calling, <coughs> we might have blown it, but it's never too late. <coughs> Excuse me. We might have blown it, but it's never too late. <coughs> we can still press on and be dedicated. We might be far behind in the race, but it is never too late because we can run a sprint and try to catch up with others. If there are dark clouds before us now, let us move forward in faith, and those clouds will roll away with God's help. Let us start moving forward towards the things of God, and God will direct our paths. Let us press on and not give up. Let us press on and go faster without stopping, because time is running out. Romans 1, 12 tells us, the night is past spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast out the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I want to ask a very important question. I want to ask you all a very important question and I want to ask me a very important question. Is your light shining for the world to see? And the question to me is, is my light shining for the world to see? If the answer is no, then we still have a lot of work to do before Jesus returns or before Jesus calls us home. God can call us home today. God can call us home tonight. God can call us home tomorrow. Many times people are deceived in thinking, well, I have time. I have time. Nobody has time. We can go to church today. We see somebody. Later on in the evening, somebody calls and says, did you hear that so and so person died? You say, no, I saw the person in church today. We don't have time. So, are we ready to meet Christ? Are we ready to meet him? Are we ready to stand in judgment before him? These are questions we have to ask ourselves. Now wait for people to ask us, are we ready?
can see that the devil is trying to attack my voice. Mm. <clears throat> so I don't proclaim the word of God. So let us try to run this race that is before us with determination. Let us forget about the successes and failures of the past. We cannot be running a race and looking behind. If we're running and looking behind, <clears throat> we might trip and we might fall down. If we're looking behind, that will slow us in the race. As we move further into our Christian life, the going be begins to get tougher and our spiritual path becomes a hill to climb. When we're walking, <clears throat> You can walk on a plane with ease. As, to, as you start to climb a hill, if you notice, you need to move with more force forward for you to be able to climb that hill. Our spiritual path becomes more challenging as we move further on. And we begin to run uphill. It becomes challenging because the devil puts all types of obstacles in our way to deter us from getting forward. We have to strive to defeat the devil and, and, and try to put as much force to press forward. So as we keep pressing on, when circumstances in life are against us, we need to press on. When we encounter people who are trying to stand in our way and be stumbling blocks in our lives, we need to press on. When people are trying to confuse us or discourage us in our walk with the Lord, let's remember, we need to press on. Many people <clears throat> drop out of the race and get weary or discouraged or they just start walking during the race. You know why they do that? <clears throat> that is because the devil causes us to forget the omnipotence of God. And that is, God is all powerful and will strengthen us along the way. <clears throat> when the devil continues to whisper constantly in our ears, that God has deserted us. Just remember that God is omnipre omnipresent. He's always around us to give us the help that we need to travel through this life's path. When the devil deceives us in believing that we are all alone and abandoned by God, and we do not know what to do next, let us remember the omniscience of the Almighty God, who knows exactly what you and I are going through, and God is determined to see us through. In Ephesians 6, 10 to 11, the Apostle Paul tells us, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul says, put on the whole armor. We cannot go to battle just wearing jeans and t-shirt. We have to be properly geared and armed for battle. When Paul says, finally, my brethren, he's telling us, finally means we are already in the race. So finally, put on the whole armor to stay strong in the battle. God desperately wants us to succeed in our walk with him. And that is why God is pleading to us when he tells us in Isaiah 1.18. He said, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God is pleading with us and wanting to hang heads with us to see what is truly the reason why some of us are not being compliant with his word. 
We are supposed to be running to God and pleading. But God is running to us and God is pleading. <clears throat> God is telling us, come now. Let us reason together. Let's hang heads. Let's talk. I see what the devil is out to do to you. Let's talk. I know that the devil is out to defeat you. Let's talk. Let me see how I can empower you. Let me see how I can help you to go through. Let me see what I can tell you to do to defeat the devil. He said, come now and let us reason together. God is begging us to talk things over so that he can help us to succeed. I will close with Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. In order to help a brother or a sister in the Lord, we have to practice humility. Humility. For it is in humbling ourselves for the sake of others that believers find their highest calling. I would repeat that. We have to be humble. <clears throat> we have to practice humility. For it is in humbling ourselves for the sake of others that believers find their highest calling. See, God read, God reads our motives. It's the motives that count. So when you're humbling yourself for the sake of others, then you find your highest calling. I can tell you right now that Jesus is beckoning to each one of us. I can hear in my spirit the words of a popular song that says, there is room at the cross for you. There is room at the cross for you. For millions have come. There's still room for more. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for each one of us. And there's room at the cross for all the other people out there. Because there's room at the cross. We need to reach out. We need to reach out to win souls. Because when that day comes, if we don't reach out, when that day comes and we stand before God, we have to give an account. We have to give an account. What are we going to tell God when he said, I put these people before you. I put you in their path. I made it possible for you to reach out. And you didn't have to do anything. What are we going to tell God on that day? We have to remember. We have to remember that God has not given us the gift that he has given us for nothing. God has not given us the power that he has given us for nothing. God has given us the power and the gifting that he knows that we can use to empower and enable others to come. Jesus is beckoning and saying there is room at the cross for many people. Right now, the road that leads to hell, the, the, the wide road, is jam-packed with people heading to disaster. The narrow road that leads to heaven is empty with few people traveling on and pressing on whilst the devil is putting obstacles in their paths. It is our place. It's our place as children of God to do what's right in the sight of God. It's our place as children of God to let the devil know that we are armed and dangerous. We are armed with the word of God and we're dangerous. It is our, it's, it is our place 
to win as many souls as we can for Christ. If we feel that is something that we're not able to do on our own because nobody can do it on their own, we have to ask God to embolden us, to give us holy boldness so that we'll be able to reach out, to reach out and talk to people that normally we won't be able to talk to. We have to reach out and just let people know. And sometimes when we don't even talk to people, let people see our lives, the way we live our lives, and let people see the light of God shining. Let people see the love of God within us. When we're able to share the love of God with other people, many people who you don't even mention the word Jesus, but they just see your love shining, shining through. They see your love, how you extend love to others. Those people sometimes will come and say, huh, I love what you got. Whatever is in you, I love what you got. What is it? And that gives you an opportunity to share with God. You to, to share God with those people. So let us be steadfast in this ways. We have to be steadfast during these normal times so that we will be able to stand steadfast during changing and difficult times. As you can see, the devil saw that God had empowered me to speak his word. And he did whatever he can to rattle my voice so that he would get me to quit. But I pressed on to all what he was doing. I pressed on to prove to him that God is almighty. God is all powerful. God is able to give me the power to press on and defeat what the devil was trying to do to me. So the devil is a defeated fool. He is defeated because God's word has gone through. God's word has gone out. God's word has reached hearts. And God's word is going to reach more hearts. Yes, more hearts would hear. The devil cannot make me crumble. On my own power, he can make me crumble. But because I have the Holy Spirit living within me, he cannot make me crumble because God is the power living within me. God is my source. God is my sustenance. So let us remember to be steadfast and unmovable during these normal times because we can all see that the times are changing for evil. The times are changing. We are in the last days so that we will be able to reach and win souls. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for your word. I just thank you for the way that you've used me. I just thank you, Lord Jesus, for your anointing, for your blessing. I just thank you, Lord Jesus, that you chose me as an empty vessel that you will be able to fill with your word and with your Holy Spirit, that I can use this voice to win souls, that I can use this voice to reach people, that I can use this voice to reach hearts. Continue to use me, O oh God. Continue to empower me, O oh God. Continue to just strengthen me. God, I ask you for you to continue to build a hedge of protection around me and protect me from the evil one. Help me, Lord, to be smart, to use with the wisdom that you've given me, to put on the whole armor, knowing that I need the armor to be able to fight against the, the fiery darts of the devil. I just thank you for those who have heard your word today. And you tell us that when your word goes out, the word doesn't return to you empty, doesn't return void. But that word is going to accomplish what you've sent it to accomplish. I know your word is going to win souls. I know your word is going to turn hearts around. And I just thank you for the blood of Jesus that is covering us and that blood that shall never lose its power. I pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.